we are in the wake of the Fed policy announcement and with the benefit of having the weekend to digest, the markets find themselves asking what comes next. Very quiet start to the week here, but ample fireworks ahead, and that's exactly what we're going to focus on here. This is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And we have a very curious week lining up for us here uh, as we consider whether what the Fed has done here is now setting the stage for a benign end to the year. And indeed, it makes sense why one might make this argument. Just earlier today, uh, we got a uh, update on U.S. PMI data that showed us that although we saw a little bit of a cooling in U.S. economic growth, it held up remarkably well and indeed has been holding up re relatively well near uh, levels of growth consistent with uh, the story even as uh, far back as May 2023, now, essentially, since May of this year. So for the past four months, growth has tended to stick near the top of the range of where it's been in the aftermath of the cool down from the post-COVID catch-up, which, of course, saw a blistering run uh, of economic uh, growth as the economy reopened, that there was a kind of settling from mid-2021 and until the end of 2022, helped along, of course, not only by just uh, dynamics of growth settling as everything uh, reopened, but the Fed rate hike cycle. Nevertheless, uh, we've since carved out a kind of range and Growth for the past four months has registered near the top of it with September, apparently another one in the trend. We likewise have uh, a situation here where uh, the Fed has seemingly told the markets everything they want to hear on policy and locked themselves into rate cuts in November and December. And yet... The markets are seemingly waiting for what's next, if only because speculation has become reality and there isn't much else in this near-term story to keep speculation swirling. So what is going to be the next shoe to drop? This is, of course, where we come in. Uh, and we'll begin with a look at how the markets behaved last week in the wake of what the Fed did. And... Likewise, then figure out where it could be that we are steering next. So let's uh, anchor ourselves f first and foremost in the numbers. Uh, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ managed gains of close to 2.5% last week. Interestingly, um, that is a bit of a come down from the performance in the prior Week The markets were much more animated in the week going into the Fed announcement than the week of the announcement itself. Nevertheless, we do see gains as the markets ultimately embrace what the Fed was putting on the table. Uh, the uh, interesting story here yields. At the 10-year, we have uh, a significant increase in rates, even as the Fed cuts by 50 basis points. At the two-year, not much change. This probably speaks to the idea that the Fed delivered essentially uh, in line with what the markets wanted and that the economy is, in fact, on solid footing, which means that the stimulus being uh, offered is supportive of prices reaccelerating higher, deflation, as it were. And so what the markets seem to be betting on here is that what the Fed has done here is 
of course, cut rates significantly at the front end, but not by more than expected, hence the very modest move in the two-year. Not only did they do that, markets were, of course, leaning to the 50 basis point cut, and that's what they got, but the markets also had baked in 25 basis points in cuts in November and December, and as we'll uh, take a look at right here, we can see the Fed has endorsed that perspective. So if we take a look here, we can see we are, relative to current levels uh, before the Fed started, of course, uh, effective policy rate was 5.33. Now it is expected for this year to be 4.44 at the end of the year, which, of course, means that we will have come down by 100 basis of points. But we have already had 50 of that done at last week's meeting, which leaves two more meetings and 50 basis points to do. So the Fed has essentially said, we will cut rates in November and December by 25 basis points, as the market anticipated ahead of the announcement. That much exactly in line. For next year, the markets had something a little bit heavier in mind. They were looking at 125 basis points in cuts. The Fed has endorsed 100 basis points of that. So left basically the fifth cut for next year up to uh, incoming economic data, which the market seemingly said is fine and reasonable. So the overall response was positive. And since growth is not apparently in some sort of a careening bad state, at least as far as the PMI numbers would suggest, and as the market's reading of last week's chipper uh, commentary from Fed Chair Powell uh, implied. And in so doing, the markets basically said, okay, well, then what that means is that the chance of a soft landing is still reasonable. The cuts at the front end are as expected, and the immediate forecasting for the rest of this year and next is as expected, give or take. Not much room then to move around yields at the front end. But at the long end, what this means is that the economy will reaccelerate with the benefit of this stimulus. So this probably means that we have uh, higher rates in the future and that this is a reflection both of economic vigor and of the inflation that's likely to have uh, a bottoming much sooner than before the pandemic. We're probably not going back to levels of inflation struggling to clear 2%. No, we're probably in a reflationary environment. With that, another week of gains in gold, a little bit more weakness in the dollar against the euro as it weakened against most of its major counterparts, but dollar strength against the yen, which fell because yields moved higher and that tends to be something that's yen negative because it encourages people to want to borrow yen, which is, of course, historically cheap to do given how low rates in Japan are, still only a touch above zero, and to re-engage with the carry trade. That is to say, shorting borrowed yen to, borrow, uh, to, to buy higher yielding assets. So because of this uh, upward nudge in yields, the yen shifted away from the overall dollar weakness narrative coming out of the Fed. As ever, crude oil marches to the, uh, the beat of its own drum recently and had itself again. Uh, it's tempting to put this in the context of the Fed, but it seems more uh, geopolitically motivated, at least uh, last week, with some escalating tensions in the Middle East. Needless to say, uh, at the start of this week, that sort of risk premium seems to be ebbing, but last week it was still very freshly in the price. And this is the backdrop that we start with. Now, we open the week in terms of incoming event risk with a central bank that has not joined the global consensus on cutting, even as the Fed has. 
That's the Reserve Bank of Australia. There's a policy announcement due out of Australia in mere hours, and it is expected to tell us uh, here their Tuesday hour Monday evening in the U.S. that they've kept rates unchanged in September. We can see that much is firmly baked in here. And uh, the focus then on the commentary out of the central bank for what comes next. And this slight downward tilt that, that we have in the current uh, policy curve for ASX futures, uh, interest rate futures uh, benchmark for Australia, the equivalent of Fed funds futures in the U.S., is that there is some sort of angling by markets in the direction of a cut, but that it's not fully baked in. In fact, we can see uh, that only about uh, half of a cut has been fully reflected by the end of this year. And indeed, if we look at the larger sweep here, the bulk of the cuts seen on the menu for next year, and as a matter of fact, that has been swelling here. And this reflects an RBA that has been resistant to cut, as we can see the outlook for this year, stuck at 11 basis points as of today, so about a 48 percent uh, chance of a 25 basis point cut so call it a coin toss 50 50 but the outlook for next year as we can see going all the way back to june growing increasingly dovish and now calling for 100 basis points uh, essentially four cuts uh for next year now this comes against a backdrop of australian economic data that has been uh, looking increasingly disappointing. We can see that overall economic growth has tended toward slowdown basically since March. Uh, this is the composite uh, PMI here in the yellow. Of course, uh, as ever, above 50 is growth, below 50 is contraction. And what we just saw for September was contraction. 49.8 on the index showing the economy shrank. That's as you continue to see deterioration in manufacturing. In fact, uh, the pace of contraction actually accelerated there. And the service sector shifting back towards standstill. Obviously, a very different story than what we see uh, in the U.S. Here, the peaks in growth were back in March. And we've since been cooling. That ostensibly uh, starts to explain why the markets think that the RBA's foot dragging this year will mean a lot of easing next year. And so this is what we're going to be looking for here from the RBA, some sort of an acknowledgement, some sort of a sense that indeed they see what's occurring in the economy, they see what the markets are trying to tell them, and they're prepared to at least start laying the groundwork. If this means that the likelihood of a cut before year end rises from about 50-50 here uh, and we start to bake in, let's say, 18 basis points, 20 basis points of a cut into the outlook, well, then it, it's going to start to look increasingly like the RBA is inching closer to joining the global consensus as its own economic data starts to scream that it's time to begin at least foaming the runway for the action that is probably needed ahead. And that what this will mean is the Australian dollar is going to come down off its recent peaks relative to its U.S. counterpart. It gets more interesting within the same context as we move on to what will be a speech from Fed Chair Jerome Powell. Uh, he's going to be giving the intro remarks at the U.S. Treasury Markets Conference uh, put on by the uh, New York branch of the Fed. And it's interesting to ponder where the market moving potential here is since, as we just said, the Fed gave the markets basically everything they wanted. But 
this is where things get interesting. The Fed chair was very clear when he spoke after the FOMC announcement saying he doesn't think the Fed is late. He doesn't think the Fed has missed the point where growth is already cooled to a, to a setting where rate cuts now are pushing back against an economic downturn already in the offing, that a soft landing is now less likely. No, he said, we don't think we're late. We think we're going to uh, be able to cut on time such that we don't unduly hurt growth even as inflation continues on its path lower. He was also, however, not prepared to own the idea that the Fed can declare victory on inflation and say, well, the inflation is good and contained. So if the message that he has on offer this week, such that it might touch on the outlook here, signals that the Fed is relatively optimistic about growth, but perhaps not quite ready to wave a mission accomplished banner on inflation, well, then it's the object of speculation du jour, the outlook for next year here, that's likely in motion. Because again, the Fed seems to have basically locked itself in at this point for this year. With only two meetings left, to say that you have 100 basis points in cuts that you need to do and doing 50 basis points of them last week seems to all but assure that you've painted yourself into a corner for November and December, barring some sort of really out there outcome. What this means is that it's 2025 that's now in play. And the markets, again, are a little bit heavier sized for what they expect relative to what the Fed has given them. This is about the only area of meaningful disparity. It's not big, but the markets see 121 basis points in cuts next year. So they are on five cuts and the Fed has said 100. If the Fed is going to start signaling here, well, growth is okay, and this is not an emergency, and we think we're going to catch this. And if that's what comes through again in Mr. Powell's comments, then the markets have about a rate cut to shed out of next year's outlook. That again might be supportive for the U.S. dollar, but it might also get stocks a bit of a wobble, especially since they've really struggled to make further headway after the Fed policy announcement, both Friday last week and in this week's Monday session. If there is a level of speculative dispersion, as it were, where there's just not the same story to speculate on with the kind of vigor that the markets embraced speculating on Fed rate cuts for much of this year, and speculative interest wanes, there might be uh, a negative story here for stocks, if only on corrective grounds. Just shedding the speculative interest built up now that that speculation has become reality. Finally, closing out the week, we have PCE data out of the U.S. This is the Fed's favored inflation gauge. Uh, and what we're looking at here is an interesting divergence. Headline inflation expected to come down to 2.3%. That, of course, uh, surely music to uh, the Fed's ears here. That would be the lowest since February of 2021. But the core measure, the one that the Fed cares the most about, because that's where most inflation continues to sit, and, of course, that's where the Fed has the most agency. It can't well mandate down global food and energy costs. That measure, the core measure, is expected to rise to 2.7% going the other way. The divergence is eye-catching because this would actually be the highest reading in four months and the largest rise in core PCE, the year-on-year -year rate, since September of 2022. 
Now, again, the story here might well be, okay, we're locked in for September and December already. But if inflation, especially at the core, is proving stickier, well, then we might well be looking at fewer cuts needed in 2025. And once again, this becomes perhaps a positive story for the U.S. dollar, perhaps a negative story for bonds, especially at the long end, because the reflation narrative starts to beckon with higher rates downwind. And again, might give stocks a bit of a wobble while they continue to be uh, slightly too dovish of the Fed's own projections for next year. And that is macro money for today. As ever, uh, we are here right after overtime, Monday through Thursday. That's a show that looks at the Wall Street close and what may happen thereafter. Uh, I co-host it with Chris Vecchio and Dylan Radigan. I'm on with Victor Jones for The Price of Truth on Wednesdays. Back with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Fridays, on with Victor and Tom for First Call Sundays, writing for the news and insights portion of TastyLive.com, and commenting sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. Macro Money's back tomorrow. See you then.